have some intuition, right? We all have some intuition. We all have some intuitive understanding of what the word quality means, right? We get to we get to watch some fun examples of. Come on, I don't want to do that. Tyler's the head of HR. Yeah, yeah, Tyler's the head of HR. That's nice, Tyler. This looks like high quality. All right, so um, we all... Have you been in a car before? Have you been in some cars that you thought were higher quality than other cars? Who owns a car? About half of us own a car right now. Um, which car manufacturer offers the highest quality vehicle? Right, so we all, we all know. Raise your hand if you think you don't know what the word quality means. So we all believe we know what the word quality means. Any ideas on which car manufacturer offers the highest quality? Right, I'll give you some choices. Is it Mercedes? Is it Kia? Chevrolet? So pick between these three. Which car manufacturer offers the highest quality? Uh, and and to, to do this, to make sure that we know what we have decided, because you must decide, you must take a stand and choose here. Everybody stand up. If you think it's Mercedes, come to this corner. If you think it's Kia, go to that corner. And if you think it's Chevy, stay up in the back. Move, 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 move. Let's go. I want to see how the I want to see how the class breaks down. So Mercedes, Kia, Chevrolet. So you guys like up along the back. You've all you've all gone GM. We're all Americans up in the back. So all right, we got Mercedes over here, Kia over here, Chevrolet up there. So what are we about? About so what are you guys? One, two, three, four, five. What are they like? What's that? Forty-five, forty-five. Well, there's five people over here, right? Oh, percent. Okay. So yeah, you know, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. It's it's. All right. Here, let me uh, just so anybody watching from home can see how we broke down. You guys cheer for Kia. Woo! Cheer for Chevy, man. And the Benz people. Yeah. All right. You guys can go sit back down. <laughs> so, um, according to J.D. Power, Kia is the highest quality vehicle on the list. Chevy coming in somewhere here in the, the just above the middle tier and Mercedes down here on the bottom. And so what do they, they, uh, they say on here what they're, what they're looking at? Problems per hundred vehicles. So they did a study, 2017 initial quality study. So these are, they surveyed people who bought one of the cars. What do you think? Is Kia the highest quality vehicle or is Mercedes the highest quality vehicle? Or is it Chevy? So you're going to stand by your choice already? You guys going to stand by your choices or who wants to switch? Raise your hand if you want to switch. Uh, you want to switch? Why do you want to switch? So Kia had fewer problems per 100 vehicles. And therefore, you're going to switch. What were you before? You were Kia. Oh, oh, sorry. It's 102. Sorry. Sorry, the, uh, the, the picture cut off the, the ones over here. Well, that means at least one person, or at least one person complained twice. Right? That's what 102 means. So it's per 100 vehicles, 
but you could have one complainer person that did all 102 complaints, right? That that would that would totally be possible. So so you guys don't want to move then. So Kia was the lowest number of complaints. That was why they're at the top. Um, I'll fix the picture. I've fixed that picture like three, four times. I don't know. It keeps sliding over. The the Mercedes trying to get out of the frame. I think is trying to drive off the screen. But um, all right. So the do we still believe in our our ranking, our groupings of quality as we perceive it internally? Though does this change anybody's mind? Yes, Robert. It changes your mind. You're not going to stop in the middle and hang out with the Chevy drivers? No? No? Um, so, it, 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 yeah, it does seem like it's statistically significant. Now, let's just think about how they did the survey, though, right? So, so we have data, right? We have a piece of data that can inform our opinions. Um, I think I'm still going to buy the Mercedes. I don't know. I think I am. I mean, I've ridden in a lot of Kias, and they're kind of nice cars. But I still think I'm going to buy the Mercedes. And, and it's so, so this type of quality, the type of quality we're talking about right here, is very subjective, right? Right? It, it's it's based on, it's based on emotions. You know, I want the Mercedes because of how I'm going to feel when I'm sitting in it. Not because it works every time. I mean, hell, I used, to, I used to drive a Jaguar. They hardly ever start. But when they do start, it's an awesome car. Right? That should be their marketing thing. We hardly ever start, but when we do, man, is it a good car. Right? So what, what is this quality that we're talking about here? Because it's beyond how many times do they break. Right? So I think what people grouped on was, was aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And then the quality that this is displaying is um, performance. I'm not even certain that this is performance. Because uh, I'm not even certain it's that. Think about how they did the study. It may not even be that. Think of how they did the study. Right. This study is biased by the people answering the question. Now, if you just spent, uh, what's the most expensive Kia cost? Anybody know? It's probably 40 grand, less than 50 probably, right? The most expensive one you could buy. What's the most expensive Mercedes cost production? About 270 last time I checked. Now, they don't sell a lot at the 270 range, but you know, they do sell a lot at the 130 range. Right and 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 all the way. I mean, the cheapest one is twenty five thousand dollars. It is the Metris minivan. That's an amazing minivan. If you're shopping for a minivan, you should get a Metris because it's actually one of the cheapest minivans on the market. Um, and it's got a two thousand twenty um, twenty five hundred pound payload capacity, which no minivan has. I would recommend one um, if you're shopping for a minivan. But but. The buyer, the Mercedes buyer, is probably, now I don't know this, I haven't studied it, but my intuition tells me the Mercedes buyer is more likely to complain. So I, I feel that this data is biased. So wh whatever, whatever data we're using when we do one of these things, we want to understand how the data was collected, and we want to understand any measurement bias that went into that. But what is quality? What's quality in manufacturing then? I think that's what the next slide says. Hey, what is this thing we call quality? So if we're looking at quality in manufacturing, what is it, what should it be? So what is this quality, what is, so, so we understand that quality can have a, a, a subjective part, right? It can be how do, quality could in part be how do we feel about something, but that, is not what we want to talk about when we talk about quality in manufacturing. Because if it's all touchy-feely, I mean, who, who's an engineer in this room? Be proud. Be proud. Most of us are engineers. Going to be engineers, right? Um, do engineers 
Historically, are, are we good at touchy feely stuff? No, that's why we became engineers, so we could take shit apart and put it back together, right? Not to feel things about it, right? That's why we became engineers. So we're not really good at that. So let's avoid that part of it. Come on, turn on. Turn on. This is low quality. Low quality presentation when I can't even turn on the thing, right? Power. Okay, reboot. Power. Oh, it turned on this time. I heard it. Maybe. Is the light switch? Anybody know where the light switch is? That's not the one. Although it was lights. That's the one. Did it finally turn on? There it is. Okay, here we go. All right. Let me refocus. Okay, I'm good to go. What's this thing we call quality? What is it? What does it mean to have quality in manufacturing? Yes. We're all engineers, right? How do you tell the extroverted engineer? They became product manager. That may be what they become. But early in their career, how do you tell the extroverted engineer? It's because they look at your shoes when they talk to you instead of their own. right? So uh, desired outcome versus actual outcome. Is that what quality is? Is a comparison of the desired outcome and the actual outcome quality or understanding quality? What else might we say quality is? How else might we describe quality? Yep. I think you like unbiased things that Sure. So let's talk about specifically quality in manufacturing. Did you know that there are job titles called quality engineer? Did you know that many of you will have that job title one day? Uh, there's quality engineers, there's quality managers. Quality manager would be the extroverted quality engineer, right? There's quality managers, there's QC directors. QC is quality control. Okay, so, so this is a thing in engineering. It's a big thing in engineering. There's the uh, ASQ. American something quality, Society for Quality, something like that. So you can join that. Um, so in engineering quality, in manufacturing quality, is it a comparison of the desired outcome versus the actual outcome? Is there more to it than simply, here's our desired thing, here's what we got? What does it mean to have a quality part? What does it mean to ship a quality part to your customer? Yes. All right, so I can know it works. I have faith I know it works. I have faith. Yes. Per four, it sounds a little bit touchy feely. It might be the other kind of quality. Yeah, I guess we're talking about shipping a quality product to the customer. If the customer has multiple vendors for this product and some of them perform better than others, then those are going to be perceived by the customer. So there's perceived quality. And I think that's really the difference here is, right? So when we, when we said our Mercedes was a higher quality vehicle than the Kia, we're talking about our perceived quality. 
as, as an observer, as a customer, right? And so there's perceived quality. And what else? So if it's not perceived quality, what is it? And it's still quality. Can it be measured quality? And that's what the JD Power guys were trying to do, right? They were trying to measure the quality of the vehicles. Now, I think that their study, their test was biased against the um, more expensive vehicles, but that's, that's just a flaw in their study. They were trying to have a measured kind of quality. And so if we're doing machining, CNC machining, and we want to understand the quality of our CNC machined parts, and we want to stay away from perceived quality, so we want to stay away from the touchy-feely stuff because we're engineers, we don't like that touchy-feely stuff. We want to talk about what can we measure, what can I put in a graph, right? Engineers like graphs. We totally like graphs. We like numbers and tables, right? So what can I measure about my CNC part? All right, so we can do operational testing. We can do operational testing. So as per the, the parts that we're making in lab, you can assemble your Sterling engine, and you can light the stuff on fire, and you can see if it works. And that would be a way to do a performance test on that. Uh, anybody ever any, anybody ever watched TV? Anybody ever bought a TV? So so one of the things that they like to do before they sell you a TV is turn it on and make sure that the picture comes out before they sell it to you. Why do they want to do that? Yeah. But you still come back with the TV. Yeah, so that you're not bitching about how bad that stupid $1,200 TV was, right? Um, all right, so that's like a performance test, a functional test. What else can we test? Because that's expensive if you screwed up, right? Getting all the way to the end and seeing if it works is expensive. That's even beyond his thing. So we can do extended. Operational testing. And you know, at, at the design phase, when you're trying to design something for later sale, you should probably be doing these kind of things. As the designer, you should probably be getting some prototypes made and doing these kind of operational tests and extended operational tests to make so that you understand the lifetime of that. But if we're the manufacturer, if we're the person who has to get the design, make the part, ship the part, what kind of things are we going to do to ensure quality? So we are going to measure length, right, width, height, which by the way are all length, right, just different, different vector direction. Length, width, and height are all length. So we can measure, what was, the, what was the last lecture about? We could measure geometric dimensions. And you, you mentioned tolerances, right? And compare them. with the tolerances. So if we measure all of the geometric dimensions on a part, and all of them are within the tolerances specified by the designer, good part, bad part. Raise your hand if you think it's a good part. Be proud. Raise your hand if you think it's a bad part. Raise your hand if you just didn't raise your hand before. How come you guys don't raise your hands? You just pick one. Good, bad. 
It doesn't count against you in the grade, but I get excited when more hands go up, which ca could count for you in the grade. If I'm excited and I remember your face having made me excited, right? Because that is totally perceived quality. That's the touchy-feely kind of quality, right? Um, and I'm an, you may figure this out, but I am not the introverted engineer, right? Which means the touchy-feely kind of quality gets me kind of excited. So you guys should remember that as we're uh, trying to get better grades. Com compare tolerances, length width, like what else besides geometric features could we measure? Right, but it's a good part. Yeah, the answer was, yeah, good part. So we can measure mass, things we can measure. Very quickly, start shouting out things we can measure. Mass, color, volume is just length. I mean, it's three lengths, but it's just length. What else? So the tolerance, do you mean variance? Yeah. So, so this is like, and so when we, and we do metrology, when we study metrology, and um, we could talk about this for a long time because my PhD is in metrology. So I'll try to spare you some of that. We're ta what, you, what you're talking about, though, is part-to-part -part repeatability, right? So, and, and there's a thing in metrology we call gauge R&R. Except I can never spell gauge. A U G E R and R. And so this is re uh, repeatability, R and R. Repeatability and what's the other R that's like repeatability? Uh, yeah. Reproducibility and repeatability. Repeatability, re reproducibility, doesn't matter which way you say them. And so one of them is the part-to-part -part variation, right? And so that's, I think we call that reproducibility. That's the reproducibility one. And this is when we say, I got 50 of these parts. Are they all the same size, right? And what's the variance on how much they're all the same size? There's repeatability, which is I have one part, and I measure it 50 times. And what's the variance in my answer? Right? And so I want the repeatability to go up for my measurement. Should I have a more sensitive or a less sensitive measurement tool? Who wants a more sensitive measurement tool if I want the repeatability to go up? Stand, because I can't see the hands. I can never tell you. More sensitive. All right. Hands up for the people that want a less sensitive tool. Is there anybody that's not made a vote? You didn't vote. Pick one. If you, if you, uh, all right, that's, that's fair. If you want a uh, higher repeatability of your measurements, should you get a more sensitive or a less sensitive measurement tool? Less sensitive. Yeah, you guys can sit down. Less sensitive wins, right? It won't be more accurate, but it will be more repeatable because it just can't distinguish different variations because some of our Repeatability is going to come from reproducibility. If you don't measure it exactly the same spot along the part every time, it's actually a reproducibility thing, not a repeatability thing. But it's re uh, repeatability, reproducibility, those all matter in measurement. We can measure mass, color, temperature, elasticity. What else? Quick, shout them out. Force. What else can we measure? That's true. There are professional tasters in the world. And they calibrate their tastings. We can measure smell too. You get a smell -a meter Then we can start putting stuff on smell -a vision Angles, I think, is just another way to do length, but let's write angles anyway, because they usually call them out separately. Oh, we didn't say length, right? Yep. We can measure speed, but it involves length. So how about we measure time? 
And then we can derive speed. We can calculate speed if we measure time. Right, which is why I'm not going to let you say density now because we've got length and mass. Although you might measure density. Now, how do you measure density? You put the thing in a beaker, you see how much water it displaces, right? And you put it on a, it, and then you put it on a scale to see how much it weighs, and then you you divide one by the other. That's how you measure density, right? So, what? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. That's why that's why we're not putting density up there because it's just length and mass. Anything else we want to measure? Yeah. Um, so if we measure force and length change, then then we're measuring strain, right? Yeah. I'm going to call it texture, which encompasses smoothness and roughness. You could also say waviness, which is, which is just roughness at a different spatial wavelength. Um, these are basically the things that we measure on manufactured parts, right? That we may, I mean, so... One way that we measure, I'm going to put measure in quotes there, one way that we measure roughness is with capacitance. So you guys know what capacitance is? It's like the like is it the likelihood of electric charge from jumping from one surface to another, something like that? Sort of like that? It's like resistance across the open gap and all that stuff. So they actually have these little things that you just put down next to the surface and it says the roughness is blah blah blah, and it never really touches the surface because it's going with that gap in electrical charge. Um, does that measure the roughness? It puts a number on the roughness. Does it measure it? What is, what is surface roughness? What is surface texture if you look at a surface? It's a bunch of heights, right? It's a bunch of ups and downs. So if you look at the cross section of a surface, it looks like that, right? If you put that in a 3D array, it's just a bunch of heights. So actually, when we measure surfaces, we're almost always measuring length. But we're measuring a lot of lengths together, and we're calculating some parameter that describes that. And so I think, yeah. So you guys have all seen this before, right? So we can measure stuff, right? Just automatically turn those lights off, didn't it? Amazing. So we can measure stuff. And I, I may have mentioned that it used to be when I had one of these $100 bill examples, I would pull a $100 bill out of my pocket and then I got married. Um, so it says very clearly here, in God we trust. Has anybody ever, it, it's on other bills too, right? It's not like the $1 bill too, right? Has anybody ever actually taken one of those and like put it under a microscope and studied it? Anybody ever studied currency under a microscope? You have? Did you focus on the in God we trust? No. I did not no? Everybody else bring data. Right? So we trust God. Everybody else needs to bring data. So we can't just measure our parts once, right? That would be a data, right? Data is actually plural. So we got to measure more than once. Who's ever done something where they measured more than once? Who's ever done something where they measured more than once? Who's ever cut a board? Measure twice, cut once, right? My dad used to say, I cut this board five times and it's still too short. So we've, we've measured more than once. What do you do when you measure more than once? If you're gonna measure more than once, what do you do? Yeah. Um, you might be trying to make your understanding of the length more accurate. Record it. You record it, right? First thing you do if you're going to measure more than... Actually, no, I just sort of look at it, right? Anybody ever experienced this? I measure this table. I think the table's five feet long. I measure the table. It comes out at four feet. What do I do? I measure the table again because I think the table's five feet long, right? And I keep measuring it until I'm either convinced that it's four feet long or I find the mistake that I made when I inadvertently measured it to be four feet long, right? Now, five feet, four feet, that's kind of easy to see for most of us. Um, but, but what about when it's closer together, right? What, what about when those two different numbers are closer together? It's very easy if you don't get the measured result that you thought you were going to get, that you immediately measure it again. 
what do you do if you measure it and it comes out at five feet? Well, I mean, what's the natural tendency, though? Not what you not what should you do. What do you do? Because what I do is I go measure the next part because this one's good, right? And intuitively, we all do that. That is bad science and it's bad engineering. If you've decided you're going to measure something 12 times, measure everything 12 times. Otherwise, you don't know if that one five-foot measurement was the one that was wrong, just because it, it meant what you uh, you believed. So, uh, so yeah, that's bad engineering, bad science. All right, so we can measure all those things. We're going to collect data. What do we do with data once we have data? All right, how do we get data? We do it by measuring, right? Well, we talked about accuracy and precision a little while ago, right? So accuracy is how close you have measured to the true value. Precision is how repeatable are your measurements. So if you're accurate, you're close to the true value. If you're precise, and you get this playing darts, right? Throw the darts, and throw the darts, and throw the darts, and they're all right next to each other. But I was shooting for 20, and they're all in the triple three. Right? All I had to do was move the dartboard. Could have been in the triple 20. So you, you guys get, get, this is an important thing, because people mis misuse these words all the time. Okay? So accuracy is how close you are to the true value. How do we know what the true value is? So we're on, the machine shop, we're on the machine shop floor, we've got our calipers. We measure the part. We get a number. If we measure once, we have no idea if we're accurate or precise, right? If we measure 12 times and we record the measurements, we can determine how precise we are pretty easily, right? So because we look at the variance between our measurement values, right? And that's going to give us an idea of how precise we are. What's the true value? No, not once we get to measurement. The true value is what's the actual length of the part, regardless of my ability to measure it. So we have, so we have tolerances over here, right? And that's the designer. The designer must decide the tolerances. Over here, we have measurements. So this is the manufacturer. And the manufacturer has uncertainty. So if I measure something, with a caliper, if I measure something with a micrometer, if I measure something with a coordinate measuring machine, if no matter what tool I use, what I have is an observation about the interaction of the tool with the thing that I measured. You guys have heard of the, 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 the physics principle that by observing something, you change it? Well, this is really true with measuring stuff with calipers. All right, so if I'm going to measure, you guys have all used calipers by now, I think, in the lab? Right? If I'm going to measure something with calipers, what, what do I have to do? In order to measure something with calipers, what, what physically must happen? Yeah. All right, so the calipers have to open wide enough for the thing to fit. Yeah. Right. So when I measure with my calipers, I got one side coming in here of the caliper, one side coming in here. Those are attached. So this is the end, right? And they get like a little pointy thing over here. There's a little pointy thing over here. There's usually a thing that sticks off the back over here. Too, but like it slides along the scale, right? This one moves. That one stays stationary. This, if this is not touching, 
this, then the measurement's big, right? The number that the caliber tells me is going to be bigger than the actual part if they're not touching. So they have to be touching. If they're touching, there has to be a finite pressure. What happens when we apply pressure to any surface? It deforms, right? We change the shape of that surface. So by the nature of measuring with a device like that, we will change the measurements. Now, if the thing has got a what high modulus of elasticity, it's going to change very little. With the accuracy or the um, accuracy is the wrong word, with the, um, what's the word we said there? Sensitivity, with the sensitivity of, of the calipers, you probably won't notice how much you squish the part unless you're measuring a marshmallow or the tip of somebody's finger, right? Then you're gonna have a big change. So it depends on what you're measuring also. So, but you've got this interaction, so you will change it by making the measurement. You will have uncertainty. Some of the uncertainty will be because of systematic errors in the measurement tool. Some of the uncertainty will be because of systematic errors in the measurement system. The measurement system includes the operator, right? So if we, uh, and, and I've done this many times in class, we'll pass around the same thing, the same set of calipers, everybody measures it, writes down the number, and then we put it all in a spreadsheet. And we'll find a big variance in the measurements because not everybody has the same amount of training using the measurement tool. Um, and, and so typically I would guess the person who's better at using calipers when measuring an outside diameter will be the one that gets the smallest number. Unless you're measuring a marshmallow and then people are going to be squeezing the marshmallow too much. Right? Um, and it's because the other thing that affects the ability of those calipers to measure that surface is whether it's twisted or not. If it's a little bit tilted, two corners of the caliper will touch instead of the flat. If it's two corners, it's going to be further away. Right? So, so we've got measurement uncertainty, we've got tolerances. The good news is, and I, and I got this from an engineer from Boeing. He said, um, and we were at a conference where we were talking about, you know, did you realize that there are conferences in the world where people sit around, a, these are geeky engineer people, sit around a table and talk about things like measurement uncertainty. Like three days, you go three days, you fly to uh, Gaithersburg, um, Maryland, that's where this one was. We sit in the headquarters of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Testing. We sit there and we talk about things like tolerances and measurement uncertainty. And so the guy from Boeing said, we do not understand, we over tolerance everything. The tolerances that we put on everything are too tight. Everything would be cheaper to manufacture if we could loosen up the tolerances. We do that, but it's okay because we do not understand our measurement uncertainty at all. And because of that, we think we're making parts that meet the tolerance when the parts we're making are actually outside the tolerance. But they're close enough that it still works because remember our tolerances are too tight. And, and he noted that if we fix one of those problems without fixing the other one, if we start to understand our measurement uncertainty, then we won't be able to afford to make anything because we can't hit the tolerances. And if we fix our tolerances without fixing the measurement uncertainty, airplanes will start falling out of the sky because we will have underbuilt them. Uh, anyway, so, so we measure stuff, put the data together. What do we do with the data? What can we do with the data when we measure stuff? First, let's, let's get back to our discussion of quality systems, right? There's a quality engineer. There's a QC manager. There's quality inspections. What's a quality inspection? Anybody? Quick. Yes. That's a typical way to do it. You, you sample one part out of a thousand or something like that. You bring it to the metrology lab, you check it, you say, this one's good, therefore the, the thousand parts, the million parts, those are good, yeah. right? So we can do that. And, or we can test every single one, right? So, so uh, anybody rock climb? A lot of people that make carabiners for rock climbing, they test every single one before they ship it to you, not one out of a thousand. 
And we like that, right? Because the cost of failure there is high. Right? So, so there's different strategies for how you select the sampling, whether you sample everything at once. So that kind of inspection that you talked about, it keeps us from shipping crap to the customer. Whether we're doing a sampling thing and we just got to figure out our sampling strategy because we understand how often we make crap and that decides our sample size. Or the risk of one of our parts being bad, being so bad that people die, that we're going to test every part. So that's our sampling thing. What else could we do? So that keeps us from shipping crap to the customer. Does it add value to the parts? Does that type of inspection add value to the part? What is the customer value? Yeah. The customer wants to pay for the stuff that they asked for. They just want it to be correct. The act of measuring adds cost, but doesn't make it more correct. It just keeps you from shipping the bad part to the customer. So it'll increase perceived quality, but it doesn't actually increase quality. Six Sigma, <laughs> Six Sigma and stuff like that. So we can check stuff before we ship it, or we could do in-process inspection to ensure that we don't make any bad stuff. Right? Does that, does that make sense? If we're not making any bad stuff, and the other thing is, I mean, we, we said we, earlier we said functional testing is the worst way, right? Right? When you get up on the rock wall and the carabiner flies open because the screw thing didn't stay screwed shut, that's a bad kind of operational test. Um, so, so we can do this uh, quality. There's, there's QC and there's not shipping crap to the customer. And there's create your systems so that you can't possibly make crap. And the second one of those is harder. It takes longer to figure out, but it's the one that makes you the most profitable by far. And so in uh, next, next time we meet is next week, right? This week is over. Okay, so next week, on Tuesday, we're going to continue this discussion of not shipping crap to the customers and understanding the tools that we can use to do this um, SPC, statistical process control, tools like Six Sigma and things like that, which keep us from making the bad parts in the first place. And we'll talk a little bit more about measurement and we'll get in depth in manufacturing economics next week. And next week on Thursday, we do not have a class scheduled for Wednesday at this point. I may change my mind about Wednesday if we don't talk about enough stuff on Tuesday. But we don't currently have a class scheduled for Wednesday next week. You guys got that? It's on the syllabus. If you look at the syllabus, you'll see that that day was left empty. That was on purpose. Partly in case something came up, we had a snow day, we had a day to slide stuff around. And partly because... I don't know about you guys, but when the end of the term arrives, I've always got more stuff going on than I can do. And so since I knew how many lectures we were going to do and I knew how many lectures we had time to do, I try to front load the beginning of the term so that there can be more relaxation time at the end of the term or time to make up for stuff that got screwed up. So um, the, the following week is the week where there's like two days of no school or something. One day of no school. Anyway, the following week, we only have one lecture. And then we have one lecture on the last week, week seven. Um, so we're winding down the term. Um, thank you guys all for being here. But I have a lot of stuff to say about metrology, so we may have to use Wednesday next week. I don't know. Or maybe we'll just do a, a special lecture for people that want to talk to me about metrology. Hey, thanks.